Neil, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Great to be with you, John. We're about a week out from your Bloomberg opinion column, uh, which really made waves uh, within Bitcoin, within broader economic circles. So I'm looking forward to digging uh, more into that with you. Uh, to start off, uh, can you kind of set the stage more broadly uh, with where the world economy was uh, pre-pandemic uh, with some of the relevant trends that you've been paying attention to uh, that maybe the pandemic has accelerated? Sure. Well, I think one way to think about the COVID-19 pandemic is that like other disasters in history, particularly other pandemics, it's had the effect of accelerating some trends that already existed. This is very obvious as a broad point about technology. Everybody knows that what we expected to happen in, in 10 years has happened in 10 months, whether it's uh, working from home, e-commerce, fintech broadly. But I think the adoption of Bitcoin, uh, as well as a kind of growth of interest in other forms of cryptocurrency and decentralized finance is one of the most important things that uh, the pandemic has accelerated. Let, let me take you back in time to set the scene more broadly. Please. 2008 was uh, an extraordinary year. Uh, it was the year uh, Satoshi published the paper that set out the case for Bitcoin, the white paper, uh, on which Bitcoin was based. And it was also the year I published The Ascent of Money. And they ha happened more or less simultaneously just before Lehman Brothers blew up and the financial crisis of uh, that year intensified. So in the first edition of Ascent of Money, I didn't really have anything to say about cryptocurrency because it didn't exist when I was writing the book. Uh, but what I did talk about were the many flaws of the existing monetary and financial system, uh, including uh, the uh, exclusion of significant proportions of humanity from the financial system, and the vagaries of uh, monetary regimes since the breakup of Bretton Woods, the dangers of fiat currency, uh, the period of inflation uh, in the 1970s when I was a kid, and then the period of near deflation that we saw uh, at the beginning of the 21st century in which the financial crisis really uh, intensified. So I then came back to the book 10 years later uh, in 2018, thinking I need to update this uh, for a 10th anniversary edition. And one of the things I need to do is I need to have a chapter that addresses uh, the phenomenon of cryptocurrency and particularly Bitcoin. So I added that. There are two new chapters in that new edition of the book. And of course, I was writing that after the 2017 Bitcoin bubble had burst. And there had been a very sharp sell-off in dollar terms. At that point in 2018, it was very fashionable to say crypto is finished. Bitcoin is, quote, shitcoin. That was uh, my old friend Nurul Rabini's take. It was all going to zero and it was the scam of the century. But I wasn't persuaded by that argument. And so in the updated Ascent of Money, I say that uh, Bitcoin is not going away and crypto uh, is not going away. They are part of a financial revolution that is actually just getting going. If you think about the 10 years after the financial crisis, much energy went into patching up the old system. That was really what regulators and legislators and bankers were preoccupied with. Not much attention was being paid to the beginning of the financial revolution, uh, the ways in which Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were being used. And so it was only really after this 10 year period of patching things up that the financial revolution could begin in earnest. And I think we're seeing in 2020 that that financial revolution has already brought all kinds of really important uh, innovations. And I think those innovations are here to stay. And I also think we'll see more in the coming years. So that in effect, the 10 years after 2018, will be much more financially revolutionary than the 10 years before when all energies were going into patching up a system that had almost collapsed in 2008, 2009. And in your piece, you pull us back into that uh, post-Black Death era uh, with, its, with its acceleration of financial change. Uh, you, you can't go into too much detail uh, with kind of word constraints there, but can you take us back to that analogy um, and kind of specifically the parallels um, and how we can be thinking about that time versus today? Well, it's actually a really important analogy that I've been thinking about quite a bit this year. 
a lot of my energy this year went into thinking about the pandemic and trying to put it in historical perspective. I've written a new book that will come out early next year that does that, entitled Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. And by comparison with what we've been through this year, uh, the Black Death was a proper catastrophe, by comparison with which COVID-19 is a walk in the park. The Black Death uh, swept across Eurasia and devastated the highly networked societies of Western Europe, reducing populations by between a third and a half. But what is not so widely known about the Black Death is that it also accelerated monetary and financial change in England and in Italy, because up until that point, the feudal economy that had emerged out of the ruins of the Roman Empire had been largely based on payments in kind, uh, that is to say, you paid your lord in the form of labor, uh, or you paid in the form of crops, of, of goods. Uh, and that was how, essentially, the peasants paid their dues uh, to their landlords. With the chronic labor shortages that followed the Black Death, uh, that system broke down, and uh, landlords found that they actually had to pay peasants to get them to work the land. And so you see uh, the rapid uh, growth of a cash-based economy, coin-based economy, uh, in, in Western Europe in the period after the 1340s. And this monetization of uh, European economic life is extremely important uh, because it's actually a much more efficient way of exchanging. Uh, you, you build markets that are much broader and much deeper once you have money and, and aren't paying in effect in the form of barter. So I hypothesized in that Bloomberg piece that we're undergoing something similar where the disruption uh, caused by the new pathogen uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the disease COVID-19 are having a similar transformative effect in the realm of money, not on the same scale because as I said the Black Death was uh, a vastly bigger disaster, but in a similar way, things that uh, were, were happening uh, suddenly begin to happen much faster. Bitcoin uh, has become a, a much more legitimate form of uh, asset, a digital asset, in the eyes of investors who previously were somewhat aloof. And one of the things I talk about in the piece is this adoption uh, of Bitcoin by superstar investors like Stan Druckenmiller, or admissions by superstar investors like Ray Dalio that they don't really understand uh, why Bitcoin is doing what it's doing. So I think the crisis of 2020 has accelerated financial history and propelled Bitcoin from that slightly shadowy place that it, uh, it was in after the bubble burst in 2017, 2018, uh, into this new kind of uh, monetary respectability or financial respectability. And I think that's really important because one of the arguments I made in the second edition of Ascent of Money was that at, at the very least, Bitcoin was going to prove itself as a kind of digital gold, uh, something that you would put in your portfolio uh, as a hedge against adverse events, and uh, what made it attractive was it didn't behave exactly the same way as gold or indeed many other assets. And so there was a kind of diversification argument that if, say, every millionaire on the planet held 0.2% of his or her portfolio in the form of Bitcoin, the price ought to be more like $15,000. This was written, remember, back in 2018 in a trough in Bitcoin valuation. Well, we passed 15000 uh, uh, quite a few weeks ago now, and we're up very close to the highs of 2017, just shy of, of $20,000. And that's, I think, mainly because of this process of adoption. And notice 0.2% is not a big weighting. In the book, in A Cent of Money, uh, second edition, I suggested you could imagine a world in which 1% of every millionaire's portfolio was held in the form of Bitcoin. And then you were looking at a really much higher price than we see today. So I think that's the story, uh, which I think is not widely understood by those people who are still talking about shitcoin and predicting uh, a kind of crypto apocalypse. Uh, they haven't seen that what we're, we're really living through is a, an adoption process where more and more individuals and institutions say, 
okay, uh, this is kind of digital gold and we want to have a piece of that. It's a crazy volatile world and who knows what 2021 will bring. Hey, that, uh, that math checks out. Uh, in, in your book, uh, The Ascent of Money, uh, in the second edition, um, 2018, you know, kind of bear market uh, time for Bitcoin, it wasn't the most, most popular opinion to have. At the risk of blowing my own trumpet, the very last page of that new edition uh, in 2018 said that uh, the next crisis would come from China. Uh, I right. didn't <laughs> say that it would be a pandemic, but I think the key point was that uh, in the wake of, of the global financial crisis, which had essentially been made in America, uh, the next obvious uh, vulnerability in the global economy was the sheer size of the Chinese economy. And, uh, and sure enough, uh, beginning right at the start of this year, I saw that this new pathogen in Wuhan was very likely to be the next uh, pandemic. And, and that, that proved right. I think, I, I think my commentary in this year uh, on events has been pretty good by, by simply applying history and saying, look, pandemics often start in China. Uh, don't believe what the Chinese say at the beginning uh, of such an outbreak any more than you believe the Soviets when Chernobyl blew up. And, and expect the pandemic to be global and to come in multiple waves. All of those were relatively easy inferences from history, but it was surprising to me back in January and February how very few commentators appreciated that we were actually in the opening phase of a global pandemic and that the United States would be hit especially hard by it because it's a very open network society, perfect uh, breeding ground for a new pathogen. That was also right after uh, Davos, where it was something that you know could have been discussed uh, by this kind of world elite, um, but you were one of the only people talking about it, talking about the risks at that point. It was strange, John, to be in Davos in mid-January and uh, be entirely surrounded by the global uh, economic and political elite talking about climate change. And I was uh, kind of running around the conference center saying, uh, I take that seriously, but there is this pathogen on its way here uh, in jet planes from Wuhan. And by the way, there are delegates from Wuhan at this conference. Do you realize that this could be a super spreader event? And very, very few people in January appreciated the magnitude of what was, uh, what was happening, showing, I think, how little uh, the elite really understands history. And uh, it is, I think, a sad reflection on the way the world is run that relatively few people with good uh, historical education get to the top. I want to get back to China. Uh, but first, uh, you run in circles with kind of some of the most powerful people um, in finance and government. Uh, Davos, obviously, um, you also moved from the East Coast uh, to Stanford in the last five years or so, uh, Harvard to Silicon Valley, um, which has really kind of become the new headquarters of the Masters of the Universe. Um, in your piece, you mentioned uh, Druckenmiller and Nouriel's recent, recent comments on Bitcoin. Uh, can you share any more about conversations that uh, you've been having uh, kind of in these circles over the last five years, um, how they've evolved, um, maybe even a side conversation or two that aren't as public? Well, I moved to Stanford four years ago uh, for a variety of reasons. I wasn't particularly following the uh, masters of the universe uh, from Wall Street sure. to, uh, to Silicon Valley. But Certainly, it helped to, to be there then uh, because I was immediately struck by a similarity. The atmosphere in Silicon Valley in 2016 was quite a lot like the atmosphere in Wall Street below the, before the financial crisis. There was a kind of sense of, well, history doesn't apply to us because we've invented the world anew. And that, that hubris, uh, which was very obvious when I arrived, uh, was followed not long after by Nemesis, the great controversy over the role of Facebook in particular in the 2016 election. So I, I wrote The Square and the Tower rather as a sort of uh, Silicon Valley version of the ascent of money, trying to explain why the rise of the internet has fundamentally altered the public sphere itself in ways that have no real analogy uh, until you go all the way back 
to the time of the printing press in Europe from the late 15th century. And so one of the arguments I've been making for a, a, a lot the last four years is essentially stop thinking that we're in the mid 20th century, enough with the analogies with the 1920s and 1930s. They're really unhelpful because actually our world is much more like the Europe of the printing press where a new communications technology radically reduces the cost of information sharing, which sounds like a great idea, except that there are lots of little uh, catches, uh, unintended consequences, polarization, proliferation of fake news, all that kind of thing. So the square on the tire is essentially an attempt to, to make historical sense of the internet and particularly the rise of the network platforms. I want to take you back a bit further than 2016, though, to, to a conversation I had two years previous to that in 2014 mm -hmm. with my son, who was then 15 uh, and is now 21. Uh, Lachlan uh, was always a kind of uh, entrepreneurial uh, kid who had his own online apparel company uh, around about that time. And I remember him saying to me, I think one summer in Martha's Vineyard, you know, Dad, we really ought to be uh, buying this thing called Bitcoin. And like the arrogant Harvard professor I then was, I said, Pah, son, um, I have to disabuse you of this naive notion because there's no way that governments around the world are going to allow a new kind of money uh, to, to come into existence that they don't control. So put aside this thought of investing in Bitcoin. Uh, this is a mere... Uh, uh, epiphenomenon. And I, I've had cause to eat my words and uh, rue the day I ignored him. And particularly uh, in 2017, when we were spending quite a lot of time together uh, during his gap year, I think he reminded me on a pretty much weekly basis how much money we could have made if I'd listened to him. So one lesson of my recent experiences, uh, do listen to your teenage children, because it's probable that they at 15 understand better than you at 50 what is going on in this new and rapidly evolving world. So I kind of learned my lesson and it was partly that experience that led me to dive into really reading up about Bitcoin and also trying to understand how it works. You've got to get involved and actually trade cryptocurrency to understand it. It can't really be figured out from a few academic papers. So, you know, in the last few years, it's been a pleasure uh, and a learning experience to dabble in this world. I, I have no claim to expertise. I'm just this, you know, well-intentioned financial historian who stumbled into the future. And I'm trying my best to learn from people who are nearly all, I think all younger than me. But you mentioned the conversations that I have with uh, various masters of the universe, which you, you kind of have when you're at Davos or Aspen or one of these places where international conferences happen. And I do vividly recall bumping into Jamie Dimon, uh, the long serving chief executive uh, officer of JP Morgan in the Stanford campus. He must have been there at the Graduate School of Business giving a talk. And we know one another reasonably well from multiple conferences over the years. And he had just given one of those interviews uh, in which he said it was tulip mania. You, you, mm -hmm. you might remember that this was the standard way in 2017 that people in established finance dismissed the Bitcoin rally. It's tulip mania. Uh, very few of those people actually know anything about the history of the great speculative bubble uh, in tulips in 17th century Holland, but leave that aside. I said to him, uh, you know, Jamie, you're wrong about uh, Bitcoin being tulip mania. Uh, that, that's the wrong analogy. Uh, and the analogy that I made at the time was with something quite different, the beginnings of equity finance. If you go back to the early uh, 1700s, uh, that's to say somewhat after the Dutch tulip mania, there was, uh, there were rather a couple of extraordinary bubbles uh, in the stock of two monopoly trading companies that had been created uh, by the British and French governments, the South Sea Company and the Mississippi Company. Now, the bubbles uh, were extraordinary and sucked in all kinds of intelligent people, including Isaac Newton. Uh, but when they burst, uh, that wasn't the end of equity finance. 
On the contrary, it, it proved to be uh, that the, there was a better use case uh, for stocks, for equities, than had been initially attempted. Because those early companies were really just supposed to be monopoly trading companies helping finance the wars that the Brits and the French were fighting against one another. Later on, it became clear that actually equity finance was ideally suited to large-scale industrial investments, funding the railways, for example. So I, I think the analogy that works much better is that crypto generally is a financial innovation that is not going to go away, but we're still running experiments to see what the best use case is for it. Uh, but I, I, I certainly disregarded that analogy with tulips because that implied that this was just kind of meaningless speculation because, you know, tulip bulbs are tulip bulbs in the end. They're, they really don't have a use case beyond plant them, watch them grow. This is different because cryptocurrency is a, a certainly a way of raising money that is novel. That was the real story of all those uh, coin offerings in 2017. Uh, but it's also more than that. I mean, it is a basis for transactions. In the case of Bitcoin, not you pay for your latte with Bitcoin, but transactions on, on scale. And I think the critical feature, going back to the original Satoshi paper, is these are transactions that are peer-to-peer -peer without any third-party verification being needed. That's the revolutionary piece. And that means that you can have financial relationships that don't require banks um, and don't require governments. Uh, and that's really, really what makes Bitcoin so interesting, that it creates a possibility for a new kind of, uh, of payment and therefore a new kind of asset. N needless to say, blockchain as a broad category of technology has all kinds of potential use cases. And I think we're still experimenting. In the ascent of money, I argued that financial history is an evolutionary story and should be understood as such. And so you get these periodic booms of, uh, of innovation, new species are created, they don't all survive, not all the cryptocurrencies of the last few years will survive. But I'm sure that like equity finance, this is here to stay, and we probably still haven't found the optimal use for it. I really like that analogy to equity finance, um, and kind of that thought of financial history, uh, as an evolutionary story. Kind of in that story, I want to go go to the play um, today between the US and China. Uh, China is making some moves with a digital currency. I uh, would love to get your thoughts on that initiative. Uh, you've spent a good bit of time in China, uh, including at Xinhua. Uh, you spent time with Henry Kissinger, uh, who's kind of, the, kind of that iconic China expert. Um, is it maybe even something that you've discussed uh, with Dr. Kissinger? Well, uh, I certainly talked to to Dr. Kissinger often as I'm in the midst of writing his biography, uh, though I think he'd be the first to say that uh, economics is not really his, his strong suit and, and, and certainly not uh, monetary innovations. Uh, what, what I can say is that clearly China has uh, blazed a trail uh, in the last few years uh, in, in a couple of quite different domains. The first is electronic payments because the scale uh, that uh, Alibaba was able to, to create for its electronic payments platform and the scale that Tencent's uh, WeChat Pay was able to establish have no uh, counterparts in the West. PayPal never got even in relative terms to this scale. And so China leapt ahead in payments uh, in, in an amazingly short space of time. And I noticed this because I was going to Beijing every year to teach at Tsinghua, something I haven't been able to do this year. But each year, you'd see fewer banknotes, um, you'd see no credit cards, and, in, and each year you'd see more people paying uh, with uh, their, uh, their phones. And, uh, and so talking to my Chinese students and, and colleagues, I was fascinated by the scale of this transformation, got to know some of the people involved, including people in, uh, in Hongzhou uh, at Alibaba and particularly at Ant and also had some interesting conversations in Shenzhen with the folks at, at Tencent and learnt a lot and realised that this was one way in which China was pulling ahead of the United States because 
in a way, China, because its banking system had lagged behind, uh, was able to kind of leapfrog into a new mode of payment because it didn't have all the legacy that we have. And we are very habituated in the United States to using plastic, to using credit and debit cards. And that wasn't really a phase that, that the Chinese population went through. So that's part one of the story. Part two of the story is that the People's Bank of China eager to try to think of ways to uh, increase uh, use of its currency outside China, but also to improve the efficiency of its own uh, policy uh, inside China, came up with the idea that they were going to do uh, some kind of central bank digital currency. And this was being discussed a good deal last year. But I mean, as late as last November, there was still no real clarity about when this was going to happen and how exactly it was going to happen. There really wasn't much detail. And I talked to PBOC people when I was last in China late last year and came away thinking they aren't really ready for prime time. Uh, the pandemic changed that. And this is another way in which the pandemic speeds history up. I think the Chinese decided that they had an opportunity to accelerate development of their digital currency and to, to run some trials, uh, not least because they, they saw it as a way quickly to transfer uh, money to citizens. Now, what is the objective here? It is a different objective from the objective of, of Ant, uh, which is to build a payments platform that becomes the standard in as much of the world as possible, uh, not just in China. I think that the PBOC and the Communist Party generally have a different priority, which is to have a complete uh, overview of all the transactions going on in China itself. Remember, this is a regime that had to impose capital controls in an exchange rate crisis back in 2015. It is a regime which, since its very inception in 1949, has prioritized surveillance of its population and sees technology as a way of making that perfect. The trouble with banknotes is they don't really tell you what people did with them. Uh, they are, uh, in, in that sense, the true cryptocurrency. And for a regime like China's, getting rid of banknotes and putting everything on a centralized, underline that three times, centralized database is highly attractive. So I don't think we should confuse these two initiatives. The pay electronic payments platforms from the private sector, from the big tech companies, are one part of China's uh, advance. But the central bank digital currency is another. And they're not entirely, I, I think, in, in, uh, in sync with one another. Indeed, it's clear that the party is wary of big tech. That's why the Ant, uh, Ant Group IPO got pulled at the last minute, because Jack Ma had had pissed off the, the party and, and, and the regulators in China. All that really amounts to a very simple proposition, though. China is ahead of the United States in electronic payments and in terms of digital currency. And the United States has become the financially conservative power. We like, or at least the US Treasury and the Federal Reserve like, the world the way it is, where the do dollar is the reserve currency, it's a fiat currency produced by the Federal Reserve and the American banking system. Uh, there is no uh, constraint on that. Uh, as long as the world wants dollars, the US government has a seemingly limitless borrowing capacity. And crucially, uh, because the US dominates a dollar-based uh, payment system, it can apply financial sanctions very readily uh, by threatening to cut people out of the SWIFT international interbank payment system. So we like that system. It is very, very helpful from the vantage point of wielding American power. But as I have been saying to people in Washington for what feels like the last two years, uh, that is a strategy for obsolescence. You are clinging to 1970s technology uh, and you are missing out on the financial revolution that's happening almost everywhere else. I mean, it's not just that China's ahead. Sometimes I think South America is ahead of North America uh, in fintech. Uh, and we are kind of sitting there saying, don't change the system. It suits us too well. And the rest of the world is obviously incentivized to change the system because as long as the U.S. dominates payments, uh, the U.S. is able to wield financial sanctions at very low cost. And every country just about has to jump. So I think that's the kind of geopolitical story here. In the context of Cold War II, fintech and particularly monetary innovation are really important because they're one of the ways that I think China has actually pulled ahead.
important uh, themes and developments, uh, certainly. I think it's helpful to break up, up thinking about that kind of between um, you know, fast payments and kind of a surveillance use case. Uh, from that context, bringing it back to the US, um, in your Bloomberg piece, you lay it out as an opportunity um, for the incoming Biden administration. Uh, not to copy what China's doing, uh, not to try to play catch up uh, on uh, the digital front, kind of on, on the existing infrastructures, um, but to integrate Bitcoin. I uh, would love to hear you kind of expand on that and maybe specifically uh, how you would advise the Biden administration to look at that opportunity. Well, I think the first point to make if one were talking to the incoming Biden administration is don't just copy what the Chinese are doing. We, we shouldn't be about trying to create our own central bank digital currency, which can put all transactions of Americans under direct uh, surveillance. Uh, in Cold War I, the danger was always that we became like our enemies. That was a recurrent theme of much Cold War literature. And I think it's just as true in Cold War II. Secondly, the, the tradition in American finance has been uh, decentralization. Uh, the American banking system, even today after the concentration we've seen in the last 10 years, uh, is still a more decentralized system than Canada's or most European banking systems, where a very few big banks uh, dominate the landscape. And by design, uh, the United States has evolved or tried to evolve a more decentralized system and also at its core, the United States is an experiment in individual liberty. That, that's the whole point of, uh, of how the founders designed the republic. And so we shouldn't unconsciously uh, submit to uh, an essentially totalitarian model in which by default, all transactions are transparent to uh, the authorities. Uh, that, that's really not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work in a free society is that uh, if we are engaged in law abiding activities, uh, then we should have privacy. It's none of the state's business and the state should only really be able to stick its nose into our financial affairs if there is reasonable reason to think that something nefarious is going on. So why reinvent the wheel? We, we actually now have in Bitcoin uh, a system of uh, blockchain based payments that has stood the test of more than 10 years, uh, which is handling a rising volume uh, of transactions, uh, a, a smaller and smaller share of which are illicit, because actually Bitcoin's not very good for criminal activity. Uh, and so why would we go to the trouble of creating something new when something uh, that already works exists? As I said earlier, there are some interesting resemblances between Bitcoin and gold. Uh, and Bitcoin isn't handy for small transactions any more than gold was. What did gold do? Uh, well, in the period from uh, the later 17th century until 1971, it became the anchor for an international monetary system uh, that was notable for uh, its uh, lack of inflation. And that was the gold standard. And the thought that I was playing with at the end of that Bloomberg opinion piece was, well, maybe we should think of, uh, of Bitcoin as a new kind of reserve asset, uh, one that we uh, can depend on not to be debased because it's programmed uh, not to be uh, inflated. It's, it's fixed. That's, that's the point about uh, being something that is in finite supply in a world of overabundance, which is characteristic of the internet. And, and Bitcoin has this sovereignty. Uh, that's a term I owe to my good friend Wences Casares, uh, one of the, the great Bitcoin investors, uh, who, who's taught me a lot uh, since we became friends a couple of years ago. Now, sovereignty is a relative concept. There really is no absolute sovereignty in the, an international system. Uh, as, by the way, my fellow Brits are going to discover after Brexit. Uh, but relative sovereignty is, is still a pretty attractive thing. Uh, compared with uh, Chinese uh, payments platforms or uh, the central bank digital currency, which are not sovereign at all, they're entirely under the control of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Bitcoin gives us at least some autonomy so that if the uh, IRS uh, wants to see my uh, my Bitcoin holdings, if it wants to go to Coinbase and, uh, and demand disclosure, it's not that easy. They actually have to go to court. So I think that that relative sovereignty is an extremely important feature. 
So my, my hypothesis is, uh, does Bitcoin have a future as a reserve asset? Some companies are already clearly thinking that way. Uh, and I wonder if ultimately there's a way to make that uh, a feature and not just some uh, bug in the international or at least in the US system. At the same time, of course, and we haven't talked about it, there's Libra. Uh, now, a, a little anecdote here. Uh, when I first got to know uh, Wences Cazares, I was actually giving a talk at a birthday party of his at the invitation of his friend, Mickey Malka. And this was before Libra had been unveiled. Uh, and I uh, gave a talk about what I saw as the future of money. And one of the things I said in that talk was, for heaven's sake, the one thing we must not do is allow uh, one of the big tech companies, especially not Facebook, to create uh, a digital currency. And the, the room was full of insiders who knew, and I didn't know, that, that was exactly what was going to happen. Uh, now, Libra, I think, started with all kinds of problems, uh, mostly arising from Facebook's compromised reputation post-2016. And my own sense is that, that Libra is going to be far more a target uh, of regulators, um, and that's already very clear from recent statements, not least by the German finance minister, than Bitcoin. Uh, so if you ask me, you know, which, which would I like to see as the standard uh, five years from now in a Western system of finance, or at least an American system of finance, that is characterized by decentralization uh, and relative privacy, uh, then I'd probably go with Bitcoin over Libra, but, but not least because Bitcoin has been around for 10 plus years uh, and Libra is still somewhere around the launch pad after multiple redesigns. So yeah, that, that's how I was thinking. It's a little bit um, early to know quite how this works. Uh, because everything hinges in the end on regulators and legislators. And as I've come to realize over the last few years, since I tried to, uh, to write and talk about these issues, they are by and large not well informed uh, and instinctively suspicious of any kind of, of innovation. And I think the great tension at the moment in the world is between the smart investors, the Druckenmillers who want to adopt uh, Bitcoin and start to think of it as uh, not just a, a security, but a distinctive kind of digital gold. And on the other side, regulators, who has, whose knee-jerk response is, as the German finance minister Olaf Scholz said this week, that we, could, we, we must do nothing to compromise the state's monopoly on money. Uh, now, whenever, whenever governments say the words monopoly and money in the same sentence, I, I do think of monopoly money. And uh, when you think about the way in which governments have been printing money with monetary growth rates, in the case of the US, uh, M2 and M3, north of 20% per annum, uh, you do have to ask yourself if there is actually some law of nature that says that the state should have a monopoly on money. And it doesn't actually. There's, there's no such historical law. The state has a relationship to money, that's for sure, because the state can determine which money is acceptable as legal tender, which money is acceptable to pay taxes, that's for sure. But historically, it's not the case that, that governments have had a complete monopoly uh, on the issuance of money. And it's not even true today, because you know most dollars are created by the banking system, not by the Fed, but by the private sector banking system. So yeah, I think that's the sort of tug of war we're going to see in the coming years between smart investors who get what Bitcoin has uh, to offer and not so smart regulators who think that it poses some kind of existential threat to their, run, their right to run the printing press. That monopoly over money uh, is certainly a powerful thing. Uh, and I think we're also uh, seeing that great tension uh, that you mentioned um, and the potential threat of regulators uh, kind of bearing itself out just this week uh, with the Stable Act uh, put forth by a couple of Congress uh, men and women. Uh, I also appreciate that kind of idyllic vision of uh, what America can be in terms of values uh, from the government down. Uh, do you get the sense that as a whole, we still value individual liberty um, and these kind of values enough uh, to be open to Bitcoin uh, as a reserve asset compared to other places? Well, I, I think the answer to that is it's not clear because in a number of ways uh, over a, a period of a century, Americans have become 
habituated to the state playing a much larger role in their lives than it did uh, in the early history of the Republic. I often have said that if Alexis de Tocqueville came back uh, to, to the United States today and looked around him and saw the extent to which the federal government had grown in its scale and the power of Washington had grown in its extent and uh, voluntary associational life had decayed, he would conclude that at some point since his last visit, uh, the French must have invaded and taken over the United States and imposed their form of government on it. So I do think we've moved a long way from the, uh, the kind of uh, constitution of liberty that was designed by the founders. On the other hand, I think Americans are uh, instinctively still quite individualistic by comparison with their counterparts elsewhere. And that, of course, has been something of a problem in the age of uh, of COVID-19, because that very individualism makes Americans chafe at mask wearing, social distancing, and almost any kind of, of regulation that, that is uh, issued by state or local governments to limit their mobility, uh, their social lives, their rights to work. Uh, the strength of that persistent sense of, uh, of individual freedom is that I do think there is uh, a readiness to resist the uh, signification of the monetary system. Economists, including some of my good friends like Ken Rogoff, want to get rid of banknotes because it'll make monetary policy easier if there aren't these pesky, uh, these pesky banknotes in the system. And if all dollars are, are digital dollars, then, then monetary policy isn't constrained at the lower bound of 0% of, of nominal rate. But from ordinary people's point of view, uh, the, the disappearance of the banknote would mean uh, a loss of privacy uh, and, and the, the recording of every transaction in ways that could be directly observed uh, by the state. And I think that, that resistance is there. We're, we're not going to get rid of cash as quickly as other societies. But the next leap, I think, that Americans need to make is to realize that there are other forms of, of payment besides uh, dollar bills that can give you that 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 privacy uh, as well as security that that you're looking for, and that's the beauty of blockchain. My friend Peter Thiel very shrewdly and brilliantly observed a couple of years ago: uh, artificial intelligence is communist, crypto is libertarian or capitalist. Great aphorism, which I've mm -hmm. been uh, reminded of this year. And so I think as it becomes clear that there are two potential systems, one which is centralized and which the Communist Party of China has complete control over, and another of which is decentralized, we will come to see that we don't need to just hang on to our, our dollar bills and coins. We can actually transition to a decentralized uh, architecture. And I think in that architecture, Bitcoin has a special place to, to to, to a special role to play because of its finite supply. So that, that's the, the, the idea that I, I can imagine that we start to see uh, Bitcoin as a reserve asset in, in the financial system with another layer of, of payments uh, uh, systems on top of it, because you're clearly not going to be buying your latte in Bitcoin. So I, 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 this is all kind of at the drawing board stage. Uh, but as I look around and, and think about the next 10 years, I can see a good future in which we take advantage of these existing technological opportunities and, and build something which is truly decentralized. Uh, I can also see a bad future in which we think, oh, we just need to copy the Chinese. After all, we copied them when it came to lockdowns, and that has proved an immensely costly way of dealing with the pandemic. I keep telling people, don't copy the mainland, copy Taiwan. Uh, because if there's, a, if there's a government that understands the way to reconcile new technology with individual liberty, it's the Taiwanese government. I think that's an important insight. Uh, I've also appreciated some of your comments on the virus response, um, track and trace versus shutting economies down. Uh, last thing, uh, we touched on Libra and how Facebook maybe didn't get, uh, didn't appreciate the level of scrutiny that they would face in terms of governments and regulators uh, for Bitcoin. Um, would you note any kind of tigers in the grass, things that people in Bitcoin maybe don't appreciate in terms of risks over the next uh, 10, 20 years and beyond? Uh, how do you think about the future uh, risks for Bitcoin and kind of the likelihood of potential outcomes there? Well, I think that the most obvious risk does come from 
uh, regulation, particularly if uh, the, the major economies uh, team up and decide to make life very difficult uh, for Bitcoin owners. That, that's happened uh, in the past in the sense that uh, it seemed inconceivable, uh, but it happened in 1933. The US government made it illegal for Americans to hold gold above a very low level and FBI agents were literally running around the United States trying to uh, confiscate illegal holdings of gold. So if the government of the United States, uh, a democracy, can do that, then uh, you, you can never regard any uh, form of, of money as entirely safe. Uh, so I think that's the concern in my mind, that we, we need to, to try to educate uh, regulators to see uh, that there are real benefits uh, to the way in which Bitcoin works, that it is entirely compatible with the financial system of a free society. And we also need to convince central bankers and finance ministers that it doesn't pose some mortal threat uh, to their business model. Now, of course, it's a de delicate path that one needs to tread uh, because you can't say out loud and by the way, the way you're running the existing system seems inordinately reckless. Uh, uh, and we probably uh, ought to have some hedge against your uh, driving the fiat uh, currency train over a cliff. But I think that's the key risk. There are a bunch of uh, technical issues that we could get into with respect, for example, to concentration of mining. But I've kind of uh, receded a little bit uh, or reduced a little bit my anxiety on that score, the scenario that the Chinese control all the mining and then ultimately control the system. I think that's less uh, of a nightmare scenario than it was when I was writing the new edition of The Ascent of Money uh, a couple of years ago. So I, I think this is mainly about uh, the education of uh, legislators, uh, regulators and central bankers um, and that's that's a challenge that that I think is going to call for more than just a few uh, proponents. Bitcoin is an amazing ecosystem of of publicity and of discussion. There's no topic that uh, I write about that gets as much traction as this. Uh, and you you are part of it. And I I think it's great that there are so many people writing and talking about this. The danger is that we are writing and talking about this to one another and not actually to the people who need to hear the story. And so part of what I'm hoping to achieve in the, in the coming months and years is to translate ideas about uh, Bitcoin and crypto more generally into language that really makes sense in Washington. We're in the midst of a political transition right now. It feels like a lot of the people coming in uh, will be even more behind the curve than the people they're replacing. And so there's really quite a, a job of, of public education to be done here. My basic takeaway is that, and this applies more generally to the way the internet has evolved, we can't win Cold War II by saying, look at our system, it's much better than Xi Jinping's because all your data is under Mark Zuckerberg's uh, control and surveillance rather than the Chinese Communist Party's. It's not enough for us to say, our centralized network architecture is better than theirs. Uh, that's an argument we're going to lose. Uh, we need to be able to say that we have a constitution of liberty in cyberspace, that the United States actually understands the importance of decentralization in the structure of the public sphere and the structure of the financial system. And we, I think, have to work out collectively what that looks like and how in practice uh, we can integrate the existing world of financial institutions and the new world uh, of blockchain-based payments um, and in a way that genuinely upholds that sacred uh, principle of American life, which is individual liberty. So that's the project. And I think we still have a lot of work to do to, to work that out and then to sell it to the people who make the decisions in Washington. Your final takeaway there really does uh, sum things up nicely. Um, would of course agree with you that this is a worthwhile project uh, and it's great to have you thinking about it um, and doing some work around it already. Neil, thanks for your time. Uh, it's been a real treat to speak uh, to you, to kind of hear you expand on Bitcoin uh, and this financial revolution that we are in the midst of, uh, especially with your context of, of past events and um, kind of your, your eye on current geopolitical trends.
Thank you, John, and and good luck with this uh, ongoing uh, series. Thanks, Neil.